Yes! TV Photo X 1.5 to FX and welcome back to another video. Well, I'm sitting reading here a little bit of a book here that I think might be a subject of a future video. Something that uh, I have dealt with uh, before. But anyway, <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, we're just going to do a little bit of an intro here what this episode is going to be about. The film medium in medium format medium. I measure myself, or was it exposing myself? Anyway, plugging some local businesses, a rotating TLR camera from the 1950s, still images in substitute for B-roll, I play with some knobs, and I'm still sitting in a chair. Welcome back. Yeah, well, as you could see, this one is going to be a little bit of a... A little bit of a find that I managed to do at uh, Tradera, a uh, site I've plagued in almost any video <laughs> up until this point when I've gotten some new piece of photographic equipment uh, and other stuff as well. A really great uh, second-hand used market for all of us here in Scandinavia. But anyway, yeah, the Yashica A, a camera that was coined by, I think it was a few years ago by Tony and Chelsea Northrup when they were ranking their favorite cameras, or at least favorite film cameras. Uh, among them were the Mamiya R RB67 and so on. But the Yashica was actually coined the generic Roliflex. And I can't really judge, I can't really other than agree that it's the generic Roli. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this is the Yashica A. It's a camera that uh, came out in 1954. And here and behold, I actually purchased this on Tradera, uh, a seller that I don't really know, know, knew what he had, but I paid 150 Swedish kroner for this, plus shipment of course, but if I'm going to translate that to some other currencies for all of you out there in YouTube land, that's basically a, uh, 13, 13 euros and 80 European cents, so about 14 euros, or in US dollars, it's equivalent to about 16 US dollars and 50 cents, or in British pounds, it's about 12 pounds and 25 British pence, so to speak. So yeah, a real bargain to get a medium format 6x6 camera that is a generic Roliflex uh, for that amount of money. It's a real classic and I'm, uh, well, I'm gonna do a little bit of a backstory before we <clears throat> move along in this. Uh, the thing is, a couple of weeks ago I needed to take a break from everything, you know, work-related stress and all of that now in COVID times and so on. Yes, that's a thing. Uh, so I needed a week to just refocus myself, a uh, previous video about that. So I went uh, away on a little bit of a trip and I brought the D700 with some lenses, previous video, link in the description. And But I actually bought, brought a second camera and that was this Yashica that I thought I'd I have to test out because I hadn't tested this. So I thought I need to put a few rolls through it, have them developed. Uppsala Photo Company, plug, plug, and uh, see if it even worked. So, yeah, I went wrong, uh, you know, it was winter time, snow, it was actually snowing, almost a little bit of a blizzard uh, when I went out with this camera once and so on. So I had to, you know, take a few shots with it and no B-roll, unfortunately, the only thing that is apparently broken on this camera is the accessory shoe holder here. You just have the th four screw holes for it, uh, otherwise it's gone. But anyway... <clears throat> I went out, took some two rolls from it, and the, the film I used, one of them was this, which uh, I think if you Google, if you search this on YouTube, you will have thousands of video upon it. It's... Uh, Portra, uh, Kodak Portra, uh, which uh, this is the 400 ISO version, since it was also in the beginning of January. It's the part of time of year when daylight is fairly scarce, so a uh, medium to higher ISO film is required. Uh, to be quite frank with you, 
This is not my favorite type of professional film. I'm much more a, a fan of Kodak Ektar, which is a 100 ISO film. And I actually put a, real, a roll of both uh, through this camera. So I might do a little bit of a review. Keep in mind, uh, Uppsala Photo Company, they developed the rolls for me, but I asked them not to cut the film, not to scan it, no prints. I'll do that myself. So I used my Canon flatbed scanner and uh, scanned the negatives. And of course I put them into Lightroom to do some color correction and so on. So yes, I do some post editing of these images. That's full transparency for me, from my part, but I really enjoy the film look that I managed to get with this. So yeah. Uh, continuing on with the features of this camera, then it's an 80 millimeter uh, lens on it with a maximum aperture of f3.5, so it's a fairly fast one. It has a maximum uh, shutter speed of 1 300th of a second, and uh, it's also a leaf shutter, so like a has most Hasselblad lenses, it's a leaf shutter mechanism, which means per. Uh, per well, which means that you have flash sync on every shutter speed. So this one actually has a PC sync cord uh, in order for you to... You can basically use this with studio strobes if you want to. Uh, it goes from f3.5 up to f22. And what else? Yeah, uh, it has a waist level finder. But it has a few tricks up its sleeve. I don't know if you can see it, but if you press on the front here, you have here a little bit of a magnifying loop. So you're able to basically uh, magnify your uh, subject and uh, pull focus fairly nicely. So that's the first little, little piece of, uh, you know, little trick with this camera. Another one, you see there's a little bit of a cutout here in the back. So if you continue to press down on the front, you actually get what is was known in the industry as a sports viewfinder. So if you were doing sports action, sports action, those types of things, you could actually compose your image through here and take the image as such. So that's a little bit of a neat feature. Then it's a little silver button on the back here in order for you to take that back up, take down the magnifier, and then just collapse the waist level viewfinder. Uh, what else is there to say about it? Well, it is a little bit, uh, when you, the operation of this camera is a little bit, you, you have to do it in stages in order to not accidentally do a double exposure. So, uh, first of all, you open the camera, you have the tripod thread down here, but around it you have a color here that it says C and O, and uh, no, O and C, O with a red arrow and uh, C with a black arrow. So, and made in Japan, stamped on the bottom here. If you turn this to the open, you release a little latch here and you can basically open the entire back of the camera. So you have it like this. And uh, what it also says here, stamped on the pressure plate, is 120 film only. So yeah, use 120 film only. So that's really a fortunate that uh, 120 is still a format that is widely accessible both in uh, both in you know uh, now with Kodak bringing back uh, Ektachrome you can get slides for this you can have uh, color negative films and you can have black and white negative films and I think even black and white positive films as well so 120 roll film is uh, quite widely uh, accessible and I've seen that one film that I've used a bit uh, that has been a little, got a little bit of a fan following now on YouTube is uh, the Czech Republic film uh, FOMA. Uh, FOMA, the film manufacturer from the Czech Republic and their FOMA pan that is uh, available in 1, 2 and 400 ISO both in uh, 35, mil 35 roll and uh, 120 roll and I I think they even do sheet film as well. And I think they have a color negative, color positive, uh, no, black and white negative, black and white positive, and I think they even have some Super 8 black and white films as well. So link to their web website in the description as well. FOMA, really recommended 
great value for the money, uh, fairly inexpensive and great results in my opinion. So anyway, yeah, that's a little bit of it uh, for this uh, film uh, camera. Well, one other little thing here. There is no frame counter on this uh, camera body. What you do have is you have a sliding red window in the back here. Well, so you, what I would recommend, and this is just my personal recommendation for these cameras, is that when you have, well, the stages you'd go through. First of all, you have to put in the film roll, uh, which I might do in a different video, I don't know. Then you have the wheel here that you actually turn to advance the film. And then you have to have a close eye on this little window here, because when the number one is visible in this window, you are basically on frame one. And then you have to manually advance the film to frame two, three, so you get 12 exposures from one 120 roll film. Uh, so yeah, you have to have that little look in consideration. Secondly, the uh, lens doesn't cock itself. Instead you have this little lever here that you pull down and you have basically cocked the shutter. And then you have the shutter release here. But one thing that these cameras like the Rolleiflex and I think also the Leicas are very famous for, listen. If you can hear that. That's the shutter release. So the shutter is extremely quiet. So if you want to do candid street photos, you can have strap lugs here, have it like this, have a little bit of a look, do some focus, compose it, and then you can just look anywhere, do a very candid shoot, candid photo shoot with this camera. So a candid camera, yep. Uh, then here you have a focusing knob on the side here, and it, the closest focus that you can do with this is one meter. And if you can uh, have a look here, you will actually see that the camera extends a bit. So it's a metal bellows focus type system on this camera. So yeah, I think that's a very interesting old school. But if you are a long time follower of mine, you will know that um, <clears throat> I have not really been that much of a, fa uh, of a fan of uh, TLR cameras like this and rangefinder uh, cameras. <clears throat> well, one reason, <clears throat> one reason that is, is because this is the lens that you actually look through in the viewfinder and this is the lens that actually takes the image. So you have a bit of a parallax uh, between these two. So if you're doing close-up photography, uh, I could actually take a, a uh, leaf from uh, when I did my uh, video about the uh, underwater photography guides uh, for the Nikonos 5. They actually have the same type of system for the Nikonos, Nikonos the cameras. What they actually propose that you do when you do close-up photography is that you compose your image, but then you can basically do this that you raise up the camera so you have your eye in the same ele elevation as the lens that actually takes the image and on this camera it basically is that the red window when you have the red window in your eye level you basically have the taking lens at your eye level so you can have that as a little bit of a workaround but there is a little bit of guesstimation involved anyway but I think that's a little bit of the charm with these older cameras. So yes, would I recommend you to get one of these? Well, if you can get a bargain like I fortunately did, I would really recommend this camera because it's a brilliant vintage piece of photography gear that will, if it works, if it has been cared for and so on, it, it can actually take some really brilliant, in my opinion, vintage type images. I'll probably get give you some uh, sample images from the two rolls that I took. Fortunately, unfortunately, no B-roll. But what this can do and what I used it for, I would really recommend it. One downside also is that this camera does not have a built-in light meter. This is the Minolta IVF or 4F. Uh, the 4F is that this is both a flash and a ambient light meter. So it's very 
versatile in my opinion. It usually, when you buy this uh, light meter, if you buy, I think Ken Kinko use, uh, or rather Kinko makes a replica of these. It, so it's still basically made as far as I know, but under a different brand name since Minolta was purchased by Sony. Uh, they're no longer around, but Kinko makes a similar light meter as far as I know. But when you get them, uh, they usually come with, uh, let's see here, I'm just gonna put this on to show you. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, this is how it will come to you. It basically has this dome on top, which is basically that you measure the amount of light that is falling on your subject. So if I would do a uh, Let's see here now, if I'm just going to put this, 1 60th of a second, uh, 400 speed, and I'll just put it to my face and do a light reading, it says 5.6 apertures, so, and then I can use the, uh, th the uh, plus and minus symbols to, if I'm uh, changing the shutter speed, I will see the corresponding f-stops. So, it, first of all, it's a great, uh, you know, for reading ambient light, it has a PC sync, uh, port as well so you can use this to measure flash so if you have a different some flash guns you can use that as well so with the mode button you go from non cord which makes it, it this to into basically like a slave flash that this will take a meter when you press the button it will wait for a flash and when the flash has gone off it will meter the light from that then you have ambient, which I have it, up, which I use, used just now, and you have cord, which is basically when you have something plugged into the PC sync connector. So this is a brilliant piece of kit, in my opinion, really recommended, and a the best thing you can get for it as well is then to get the uh, spot meter for it. It has a swivel top here. The, the meter head has, is swivelable, so you can basically use it like so, if I'm measuring on the camera, like so. And I get, uh, for 1 60 of a second, it wants f4 to properly expose the camera. So now I have turned this basically into a spot meter. A, so this is basically a brilliant tool to have when you are out shooting with a camera that doesn't have a built-in light meter. For my, me, it's basically the Ashika, and when I go out with my Hasselblads, this is a must-have tool, in my opinion. If I do have a metered prism finder for the Hasselblad, but if I want to dip, that is basically a ambient, the entire frame, but if I do want to do a spot metering on any type, any part of the image or the composition, this is a must-have tool. And as far as I know, this can both do still photography, but it can also be used for cinema. So if I'm wanting to do uh, like a project I would really want to do in the future, uh, to do something with uh, Super 8 or even uh, Super 16, this is a brilliant piece of kit because I can basically put in the frame rate and the aperture and it will tell me, you know, what aperture and so on I want to, I should have to have a properly exposed image and so on, so, or a, a properly exposed movie. So, this is not a one trick pony, it's a brilliant piece of photography gear that I would really recommend to anybody who is interested in film photography or a video or film in general. So, yeah, I thought that that would be all for me for now. And uh, as always, this is Tobias Bergstrom from TB Photo X 1.5 to FX. And I'd like to see you guys in the next video. And as always, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you find this video boring, please put, uh, press the thumbs down button twice. So I'll see you in the next one and take care for now on. Bye.